Ops 10. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Rare was essentially built around, as Sally mentioned, this, this one uh, publication where we talked about metrics, 10 metrics and whatnot. And I'm just going to talk about my contribution to those metrics. And they devolve, they revolve around the concept of, of information. And before I start with my slides, I'd like to try to ask you to, to think broadly about what information is, because we say information, we immediately think of, you know, a message, codification, uh, genomes and, and instructions to build uh, uh, proteins and so forth. But, but information has a broader meaning. And you see that especially when you look at the mathematics connected with information, that it applies not just to those situations, but to, uh, uh, to, to, to larger dynamical systems in the, in the sense of uh, how well is this system connected and mutualistic and how is it free and, uh, 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 should I say, disorders, so to speak, so that uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's free to change and whatnot. And uh, that calculation is extremely important, I believe. Now, let me see if I can share a screen here. Uh, okay, well, yes, doesn't look like I can uh, hold it just a second. Uh, I think if you hit the button at the bottom right, the, the, yeah. the square with the Yeah, arrows. I know. <laughs> Try to find it on my machine. It's Well, I think you can probably see it as it is. But uh, uh, so I, I'm proposing that we look information more as constraint. OK, uh, the idea being that, uh, uh, first of all, information is predicated on the lack of certainty. It's predicated on something that doesn't exist. Very important concept. Uh, and that uh, when things are constrained, uh, then, then you, you begin to see their, their integrity and that they do exist in contrast to, 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 to disorder and non-existence. Well, uh, information is constraint uh, has been quantified by Boltzmann and Gibbs in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, many of you as ecologists would perhaps recognize the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, and I put entropy in quotation marks for reasons I'll talk about in a little while, uh, and that, that, that it is defined as the summation of the negative logs of probabilities times the probabilities themselves, and it's always the positive quantity. Um, let's see where... Ah. Oops. Okay, I'm, I'm just a second. Going back here. Ah, oh, there we go. Good. Now, information has to do with probabilities, logs of probabilities, for example. Um, and uh, uh, there's nothing particularly uh, informative about probabilities, but, but uh, I'd like to, to apply information to networks. And networks uh, have more than just a single distribution and whatnot. We can talk about uh, joint probabilities. If something flows through both I and J, there is a joint probability that it visits both I and J. So we can, we can uh, generalize uh, the 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 uh, Boltzmann Gibbs uh, equation to apply to uh, to joint entropy uh, just by summing the the, the joint uh, things. Now the, the 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 advantage, the big advantage of doing this, is that it allows you uh, it allows you to decompose. It's decomposable. The, the joint entropy. You can break it apart into two quantities, both of which are always non-negative. Uh, the first one is the uh, uh, what's called the average mutual information, but it, what it really is, it's a it's a measure of how how interconnected the various elements are. That's supposed to 
what's called the, the conditional entropy, which tells how free they are of each other, how independent they are of each other. So that uh, you have uh, mutual constraint and the absence of mutual constraint. Uh, I'll also define what I what I mean as degree of order. Okay, uh, going back, if if uh, if a is is how much mutual constraint, and I divide it by the sum of these two, uh, I'll get uh, uh, small a the degree of order, and that that degree always lies between one and zero. Uh, phi the other one is always the complement of a. Uh, and then I'll define one more thing, uh, which I call the fitness to evolve. And, and here I take a, uh, a, uh, a note from, from Boltzmann. Uh, the idea with, that Boltzmann described uh, essentially essence as, as A, the degree of order A, but he didn't describe the disorder as one over A. He described it as minus log A, which, in which, uh, uh, is uniformly connected with, with 1 over A uh, and, and excuse the distribution towards smaller things and so forth. Now, the question is, if I take ecosystems networks, and I should have a picture of ecosystem networks to, to show you, and uh, I apply these, these metrics to the networks, how do they fall out? And a very, very surprising thing happened. They tend to cluster. Uh, they cluster uh, not around, okay, if things are very low order, uh, they have no cohesion, they're totally cha cha chaotic, they fall apart. However, if things are very ordered, you know, with a high degree of order, they tend to be very streamlined and efficient, and they tend to, to be vulnerable to perturbation, especially to novel perturbations. So what we're discovering with ecosystems is that there's sort of a, a sweet area, which I've called the window of vitality, uh, where, where living systems congregate, okay? And if they get too efficient, they fall, they essentially fall apart due to perturbations. If they, if they don't have enough uh, uh, cohesion and so forth, they fall apart just spontaneously. Um, So what are some conclusions that we can take and apply elsewhere? Uh, first of all, ecosystems do not maximize efficiency. Now, this is something that's, that's heterodox in evolutionary theory. In evolutionary theory, you always have maximization of, of, uh, of fitness or maximization of, of predator, uh, 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 predator saturation or something like that. It's always uh, a, a maximum. But maximum efficiency tends to rule our, our life. For example, uh, uh, just back during the, the pandemic, we had uh, supply chains. Supply chains were neatly honed to be efficient by, uh, by opera operations research people. They were so efficient that when we had a perturbation, they failed, okay? And as a matter of fact, there were even a couple of publications that pointed this out, that, that they that the, that the supply chains were too efficient. So we have to, to really mitigate our, uh, our concept of, of efficiency. And this has been picked up, I think Brian was the help in all of this. He has some people in, in Texas A&M that he put on to this that, that, that use this as an engineering dictum, if you will. The idea that uh, if, you have, if you're designing a distribution system, uh, don't design it for maximum efficiency. Allow for a little bit of flexibility so that uh, you know when, when unexpected things happen, the system can adapt and it doesn't collapse completely. I call this fail soft design. Um, and this has been applied to power grids, okay? Rather than have your whole power grid completely blank out, uh, you can localize things and so forth, uh, to water distribution systems, to traffic flow, as I said, to supply chains. Uh, there, are a number of, there are a number of things that this particular maxim, and the, and the calculus and the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the 
the magnitudes that go with them are being applied to design of distribution systems. And then the second thing I'd like to mention is that ecosystem dynamics are dialectical. If you go back to, to, uh, to, to this, this uh, uh, decomposition of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Boltzmann-Gibbs uh, entropy, you, you discover that it's not all entropy. First of all, Boltzmann was talking about something called an ideal gas. An ideal gas is an imaginary thing. It doesn't really exist, where the molecules are totally independent of one, one another. You have to search far and wide in the universe to find things that are totally independent like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, people now recognize the Boltzmann-Gibbs equation as a measure of entropy. But if you're dealing with something where there are connections and there are constraints, that's not entropy anymore. What you find out is the Boltzmann-Gibbs is a combination of both constraint and lack of constraint. And you can parse them out as soon as you know what the network looks like. So that uh, what you have is that ecosystems maintain a balance between coherence and efficiency and flexibility. And if they get too far off balance, they go out of existence. Okay, so that 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 living systems are really dialectical in the in the Asian sense of yin yang. Okay, uh, uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll add one more thing, and then I'll I'll shut up and so forth. This whole idea of uh, of entropy, it is it is what I call an apophasis. It's something that does not exist. Okay, it consists of things that that do not exist or no longer exist. But the problem is we talk about increase in entropy, we think about it in a positivist way as if it's a real thing that's increasing. It's not, okay? It is, it is lack of constraint. It is lack of something. Now you say, how can you possibly quantify something that doesn't exist? But we do it all the time. If I say uh, this glass is uh, one two thirds full, uh, it means that it's two thirds fluid and one third emptiness doesn't exist, okay? And the, the non-existence is always referred to the capacity of the glass, okay? So you have to always refer entropy to the capacity, the maximum capacity can have. And this is the third law of thermodynamics, that like you cannot define entropy without reference to some positivist quantity. Um, and, and unfortunately, thinking about entropy in a positive way leads to some strange notions like, Okay, we know that uh, from Eddington that the second law of thermodynamics is always, always, always exists. If what you say uh, violates the second law, forget about it. It's it's gone. Um, uh, I, okay, what what I'm saying is yes, it is necessary, but it doesn't lead evolution. Evolution is led by what I call uh, agency, and agency is involved, as Brian mentioned, with positive feedbacks with what's called autocatalysis, the ability to discern, okay? So that, so that the universe is expanding, uh, entropic systems are expanding, and what they do is they essentially cause a local vacuum. And the question is, what fills that local vacuum? And it's usually, it's usually a, uh, an agency of some sort. But way an agency it exists is not predetermined, okay? Uh, so that it gives you a different sense of the dynamics of the world, the dynamics of cosmology, for example, uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, maximum entropy is a very important thing. It's a necessary thing, but it doesn't really lead evolution. Well, with that heresy, I, I'll, I'll be quiet and shut up and uh, uh, entertain any, any questions. Uh, let me see if I can... Bob, as you mentioned, uh, I it, we met a long time ago and back in, in the good old days of West sort of thing <laughs> that right. uh, Sally and, and Jason mentioned. Uh, but first of all, I'd say, one, excellent presentation. Two, I at last understand what you were trying to communicate with your 
assertions about mutual information. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, the, the thing that impresses me about this presentation is that you clearly distinguish uh, the fact that in information as a probability function, as opposed to a concrete entity of some form, uh, explains or is the, use, the semantics of the word entropy and its relationship to information. And this is a crucial distinction uh, in your definition and the mathematics of joint probabilities that you express so clearly and so uh, acutely, I, I would say. With that as background, I would point out that uh, in my own work, in the relationship between chemistry and category theory. Category theory, yeah. Okay, that the situation here is that you expand from a joint mutual probability to an n-dimensional, if you would, mutual probability. Yeah. No. Very simply, no, I... an expansion from simple binary probability distributions to n-dimensional mm -hmm. joint probability distributions. And it also says that the causality is distributed over that. And incidentally, I should have made reference to your, to your category theory because it's been very important in my thinking as well. Um, but, but that the idea that causality isn't always just binary, it's distributed. It's distributed over the system. And we need to we need to to reckon that, and that's why networks are so such useful tools for doing that. Uh, uh, since you're trained as a chemical engineer, as I recall, yes, you might want to expand your thinking to look at the notion of the law of mass action in terms that you've just described, because the law of mass action, when applied to chemical systems, generates polynomials. And these polynomials are derivative of the atomic numbers. So the agency of the atomic numbers becomes constituents of the polynomials, which become constituents of the joint causality issues. Okay, your key word there is agency, and I would agree with that <laughs> in the sense that uh, the law of mass action uh, tends to be, uh, how should I say, uh, non-referential or... or um, uh, Hom homogeneous, whereas whereas what what happens with feedbacks is that you actually get selection, and selection is 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 agency. As I say, when 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 things when entropy increases because the universe is is expanding, other agencies jump in to make things happen. It's agency that makes things happen, not entropy. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jerry. I, I think we've been talking, we've been thinking about in parallel lines for a long while now, ever since the OLSS. Yeah. Very uh, insert. Uh, let's, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, I mean, let me insert a, a little reminder of uh, our regular discussion kind of a format. Uh, we usually do uh, four attentions. Uh, the first attention is uh, what? So in namely what the speaker is trying to tell us and uh, what my cognition systems are reconstructing something uh, as closer as to what the speaker wants to give us. So that's what stage. stage. And the next stage it would be in the gut. So what will be my immediate reaction uh, or, or the most of the questions of um, clarification comes from here. So the gut stage is direct response without too much thinking. Now, third stage is, uh, so what? So what <laughs> is a little bit more expansion on the logic deduction or, or some kind of consequences considering expanding of the system being considered. And last stage is very, very important. Uh, is now what? So, so what, gut, so what, and uh, now what? Now what is the action stage? Is what are we going to do with whatever we learn here? So, so that's just a little reminder for you guys. Uh, I guess Jerome has been taking notes, so Jerome is trying to say something. Jerome and I are trying to do